A company pays its employees an average wage of $23 an hour with a standard deviation of $4.40. If the wages are approximately normally distributed, the proportion of the workers getting wages between $21 and $24.75 an hour is most close to what? So we're told that the average wage is $23 for this that this company pays. We know there's a standard deviation of $4.40. And we're asked what the proportion of employees that work at this company will fall between some specified range, which is right there highlighted on your screen. So again, we hop back to page 39 of your NCES reference handbook. If you have it right now, hopefully you're, hopefully you're referring back to it along with me. We like this little nugget of a section right here that kind of outlines everything we need to know about normal distributions or at least points us in the right direction that we need to go in solving these types of problems. So if we hop back over and bring our normal distribution function, we know our variables are going to be the x is our random discrete variable. We know our mean is mu. We know our standard deviation is sigma, and of course the output is going to be the probability. So what are we given? We're given the average wage is $23, hours, $23 an hour. We're given that as there's a standard deviation of $4.40. And our experiment is that we want to determine what proportion of the workers are getting wages between one random variable of $21 and a second random variable of $24.75? So this is interesting because at this point now we have two random variables that we're actually analyzing. So we're going to have to approach this one a little bit differently, and let's explain that. Again, we're looking for the proportion of workers that will be falling between the pay of $21 and $24.75. Now, if we hop back to our normal distribution tables, we're actually going to have to use our normal dis unit normal distribution table in the back of the book. So it doesn't really tell you where this is located. However, it's still in the probability and statistics section, but you're going to flip back to page 46. And these are tables you're going to have to become very, very familiar with and very comfortable with and understand what each of those columns mean and represent as you work your way through these problems. If you're left thinking about which column to use on the exam, believe me, you're wasting your time and you're going to significantly get behind in solving these types of problems. So let's go ahead and pull that little section again. We've highlighted the little area down at the very bottom of that section that kind of explains what a unit normal distribution table is. And specifically, it tells us what each column means. So F x is the area under the curve from negative infinity up to x. rx is from x to infinity, so x is a random discrete variable. wx is the area under the curve between negative x and x, so that's when it has a uniform banded region, which would be a great case, but we never experience, as the, experience those, it seems like, so we have to kind of Pick and, pick and choose which columns we use and kind of start molding and mending and tweaking those numbers so that they get us our final result that we're looking for. And then, of course, that final little piece right there, F negative X, simply just means that if you have a negative value, a negative discrete number, it's simply 1 minus the positive Fx. And I'll explain that a little bit as we move forward in this material. So hopping back over to our problem statement, again, we're looking for the proportion of workers getting wages between some range. So in actuality, we pull the probability density function for normal distribution over, but we're not going to actually be able to use that because that only gives us the probability that exactly that wage would occur. So in this problem, it would say something about the company paying an average wage. The standard deviation would be the same. 
but the question would actually ask, what are the chances, what is the probability, whatever, that an individual is making $21? Or what is the probability that an individual is making $24.75? So it's the probability density function or the, of the normal distribution function is used when we're looking for exactly a single discrete random variable. But in this case, we're looking for a cumulative probability or proportion of workers between a banded, uh, two banded variables. So let's hop back over to page 46 of our NCES reference handbook and look at our unit normal distribution tables. And I wanted to kind of hone in on a few things here just for edification purposes. If you notice right here, it says when mu is zero and sigma is equal to one, so when the standard deviation is one, when the mean is zero, then the distribution can be called a standardized or unit normal distribution. And if you look over at the table, I've highlighted the title of this table. It is a unit normal distribution. So this table is specifically developed for situations where we have a mean of zero and where we have a standard deviation of one, specifically for those situations. So what do we do when we don't have a mean equal to zero or a standard deviation equal to one? which in this case we don't. So if we look over to our little snippet, once again, I highlighted in green, something we call the z scored. Now, many of you are probably familiar with this from the university. It doesn't state it uh, or how to even use it in the NCES reference handbook. So I'm gonna drop that knowledge on you guys tonight so you understand where to implement this and why it's so powerful because it actually allows us to use the unit normal distribution tables. But when we have a mean that's not zero and a standard deviation that is not one, all is not lost with the unit normal distribution tables. In fact, we can use what's called the z-score. We can convert it into a z-score and knowing that the z-score follows a standardized normal distribution function or a unit normal distribution, we can take that z-score and reference the table as we would otherwise with the mean being zero and the standard deviation being one. So it's the same thing. So just because it's called the unit normal distribution table does not mean it we're just set in stone to use that when the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. All we need to do is take our values, convert them into what we call a z-score, and then reference those values in our tables and move forward with our calculations. So the z-score essentially becomes that x column. The z-score essentially becomes that x column. I've highlighted, highlighted it right there in the left side. All right, so popping back over to our problem statement, I brought our z-score again. Everything is pretty much the same. We got our random discrete variable, we got our mean, and then we got our standard deviation. And when we pump all those pieces of bits of information into our formula, we'll determine what our z-score is for that particular random discrete variable, which as you'll see, we call uh, the lower, we call them lower bands band and the upper bands. And uh, I'll actually use that terminology in a later example problem. But let's just say right now we have two random variable x's. We need to determine what the z-score is for each one. So again, we got our random variable x. We got our mean, and then we have our standard deviation. For our first random variable, we plug in our information, and we find that we got a z-score of negative 0.456. Now doing the same for our second random variable, we find that we have a z-score of 0.398. So that's where we will start. So let's go ahead and take these z-scores back to our unit normal distribution tables. We'll put them right there for reference. If these z-scores were uniform, 
say if z1 equals z2, so for instance, one was negative 4.56 and the other was 4.56, that we can actually use that final column wx, which would give us the banded probability of uh, you know a proportion of these workers falling between that banded range. Unfortunately, we do not have a uniform band here, and we have to actually use other columns and kind of begin to combine and tweak them to get what we're ultimately looking for, which is a band that is illustrated like that, but is just not uniform, so we can't use that column. So what we'll actually do is head back to that FX column that I highlighted right there with the blue outline. And we'll go ahead and start with our first Z-score. So our first Z-score is negative 0.456. So what do we do? If you look in the X column, which is our where our Z-scores are represented, there are no negative values, but as we established previously, if we have a negative z-score, it's simply the reverse of what we see presented in this column fx. So if you look at the top of that fx, we simply just flip the curve. And those probabilities and the areas under the curve from positive infinity back to x will be exactly identical as you see presented there. So if it's a negative symbol, we're just visually or in our head flipping that column and we just have to understand that it's from positive infinity back to the negative value rather than from negative infinity up to the positive value. So again, we're gonna look at our X column which is where our Z scores are located. We find that we have a, our Z score is going to fall somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5. And when we expand that out, we see that our probability then, or the area under this curve, is going to fall between 0.65 and 0.69. But when you interpolate those two values, we find that the Z score, when Z is greater than negative 0.456, the area under that curve is 0.676. So that's our first probability we're after. Now let's focus on kind of just illustrating and visualizing what this looks like. So here's our normal distribution curve. That's a bell curve we're all used to seeing. And what this is saying that under that bell curve in that gray area, that the probability or the area under any probability density function curve is equal to one. So from positive infinity back to negative 0.456, our z-score negative 0.456, then the area in blue right there is equal to 0.676. So 68% or 67.6% .6 of the area under this normal distribution curve falls within that range right there that you see. So that's what that, uh, what that uh, probability is gonna look like on your normal distribution curve. So let's go ahead and mute that and move to our second z-score of 0.398. And in this case, we have a positive value, which is how they are presented to us in our NCES reference handbook in our unit normal distribution table. So all we need to do is hone in on that x column. We find that our value is going to fall somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. There's our probabilities of those two of those two values. And when we interpolate, we're going to find that uh, it equals 0.655. So if we look over to our normal distribution curve again, what this is telling us from positive or from negative infinity up to the z-score of 0.398. The area under the curve is going to be 0 0.6. Five, five, and that's the same distribution curve. So 65.5% of the curve is going to be highlighted by our second z-score. 67% of it will be highlighted by our first z-score. And as you can see, there's going to be some overlap that occurs. So there's our first z-score, which overlaps our second z-score and the area that falls under that. And what we're really interested with in is the range between our first z-score of negative 0.456 which represents our lower band of 21 dollars 
and our upper band, which is represented by our second z-score of 0.398. So knowing that our first or our second z-score goes all the way up to 0.398, we know that we have all the information we need with our first z-score, and if we just subtract off this, this tail end somehow, figure that out, then we'll be able to determine what that little blue banded section region is right there in the middle. So we notice that banded blue starts at 0.398 and goes up to plus infinity, and that 0.398 is actually the end of our second z-score from negative infinity up to 0.398. And knowing that the probability or the area under the curve is equal to one, the total area, all we need to do is actually subtract one minus the probability of our second z-score. So I see it outlined right there to get that little tell end that we're looking to define and subtract out from our first z-score probability. So that's 1 minus 0.655, and we find that the remaining area under the curve that we want to subtract out from 0.398 up to positive infinity is going to be 0.345. And we did this manually just to kind of illustrate the process and the, 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 the fundamentals of the area of the uh, characteristics of a normal distribution curve. But if you actually went over to the column Rx, which is the next column over, you, could, you can kind of see how the z-score would have fell right in between the two values that we found for 0.3 and 0.4 at 0.345. All right, so those are our two values we're going to be interested in. We're still interested in our first z-score, which gives us a value from negative 4.456 all the way up to positive infinity. And to get our little banded probability, we want to subtract everything after 0.398. So we've derived that number and value as well. So there's the full value minus our little snippet. Let's go ahead and pull these back over to our problem statement. So we got 0.676 and 0.345. Our cumulative probability, our banded probability is going to be between negative 0.456 and 0.398. We plug in our numbers and we find that that probability is going to be 0.331. So the proportion of the workers that are getting the wages between $21 and $24.75 will be 33.1%.